Okay. So hopefully um, this will work. Um, so good, good morning, everybody, and thank you for uh, for joining. It's a real pleasure to be doing this. Uh, slightly new thing for me uh, to be giving a, a presentation and then uh, interview to questions uh, from out there in the internet in the ether. Um, under the circumstances, it's understandable. Um, I would prefer to be doing it in person, of course. Um, but what I thought I'd do to start off with um, is just give a, I think it's, I think it's always useful when um, you're, you're trying to learn about um, engineering and what you might be doing in engineering. I think it's always useful to get a sense of why the person who you're talking to about it um, ended up uh, where they did. So I'm going to try to give you a, a potted history very quickly uh, of how it is that I became uh, a structural engineer who works mostly in, in areas related to fire safety and fire safety engineering. Um, so my name is, is, is Luke Bisbee. I'm a professor in the School of Engineering at the University of Edinburgh, uh, which is in Scotland, obviously. Uh, my accent, uh, hopefully you can tell, is not Scottish. It's actually a Canadian accent. I was born and raised um, and, and educated in Canada as a, as a civil engineer and then a structural engineer. Um, and, uh, and, and now having lived in the UK for, for 12 years, I'm a chartered structural engineer, uh, and as I said, a professor at the, uh, at the University of Edinburgh. Um, so, how did I become a, a, a structural engineer who works in this area? Um, well, when I, when I was a youngster, um, probably my, my favorite thing to do was to play with, uh, with Lego. Uh, and I think if you enjoy building things, then, then engineering uh, is it's not a bad choice for you. Um, I also, um, when I was uh, about eight or nine years old, I lived in Bristol for a period. And I lived in, in a part of Bristol called Clifton. And I looked at this bridge. Um, at every opportunity, I was absolutely amazed by this structure by Brunel's Clifton Bridge. Um, and I think that this is probably um, the kernel of, or, or you know, the, the thing that made me want to become an engineer was just falling in love with this structure and wanting to be able to design structures like that uh, when I was older. I then became a very avid um, skateboarder. I got very into skateboarding. Um, and I started to build things that were real. So I started to build, um, for, for example, this is a picture of a, of a skateboard launch ramp. And I got, I got very excited by carpentry and building and understanding the way materials interact with each other and connect to each other. Um, and I think that kind of um, got me very interested in the way that materials behave when you load them, um, which is obviously a very important part of structural engineering. I was also very interested in art. And so I thought if you combine all those things that I love, you end up becoming an architect, of course, and you design um, beautiful structures like um, Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water, which I've uh, shown in this picture here. Now, unfortunately for me, uh, it turned out that I wasn't actually very good at drawing in an artistic way. Um, but what I was good at was drawing in a very technical way. And I took a course in my, uh, in my 12th year of, of school, so when I was in high school, I took a course in technical illustration and I learned how to draw things like gear sets and, and cogs and bolts and nuts and how they all fit together. Um, and so that turned into, um, rather than architecture, a degree in, in engineering. And I went to McGill University, which is in Montreal in Canada, and I got a degree in civil engineering. And when I finished my degree, um, I didn't know what I wanted to do next. I, I had a structural engineering education, but I didn't know what, what I wanted to do with that. Um, and then I read an article um, in a magazine about a proposal for a bridge that was going to join Spain to Africa across the Straits of Gibraltar. And this um, rather grainy uh, diagram here shows uh, what that proposal looked like. And, and whilst it's hard to see in this, in this diagram, um, the central span of this bridge, the distance from one tower to the next tower, is 8.4 kilometers. And the tallest of those two towers is uh, 1.25 kilometers high. Now, keep in mind that the tallest building in the world um, right now is around 800 meters tall. So that tower would be taller than the tallest building in the world. The longest suspension bridge in the world right now, actually at that time, was the Akashi Keiko Bridge in Japan. Uh, and I'll make that appear here. And that's how big the longest bridge in the world is right now in comparison to this proposal that I saw for this bridge across the Straits of Gibraltar. And that was in about 1997, so about 23, 24 years ago um, now. So that got me really excited. 
Um, and, and what got me most excited about was these new materials that were appearing in structural engineering, which are called carbon fiber composites. And, and these materials are so strong and so lightweight that they could allow engineers to design these really uh, very, very long span structures. And so I thought, ah, oh, that's what I want to do. So what I did then was I went to graduate school and I did a master's degree and then I did a PhD um, looking at the use of these carbon fiber composite materials, um, carbon fiber reinforced polymers, they're called, um, and using them to design structures. So this is a picture of me during my, my PhD um, work. Uh, about 20 years ago, this picture was taken. And what I'm doing here is I'm wrapping carbon fiber fabric around a reinforced concrete column. And the reason that I'm doing that is to provide that column with a whole lot of additional strength um, with a very, very thin layer of, of what is essentially carbon fiber wallpaper. Now that's very exciting and it was getting me into the area that I wanted to work. But one of the problems with carbon fiber reinforced polymer is that it burns and it burns um, quite enthusiastically actually. So fire safety becomes a real problem if you're designing um, structures out of a material that burns. And that, that's what really got me into um, fire safety in the first place and got me interested um, in fire safety. And if you've never, we, we all have an experience um, of fire and we all think we understand fire. Um, most of us have lit a match and looked at the flame or we've, we've stood and looked at a, at a candle or a campfire or maybe you have a wood burner in your home. Um, and you know, you, you set a match to something and it, it lights on fire and then it burns. And, and we have this intuitive understanding of, of fire, but most of us don't really understand or even stop to think about the complexity of the process of fire, which is this really interesting physical chemical um, reaction. Um, so the picture that I have here now is a, is a match flame. Um, and if you just look at a match burning, um, it, it looks like a very simple thing, but there's a lot going on here. Firstly, what you have is you have some pyrolysis going on of the, the solid fuel. Uh, the solid fuel is being heated and it's uh, gasifying and what's coming off the solid fuel is what's actually burning. And so the fuel gasifies, um, it moves up because of buoyant flow, because hot air rises. Um, you get air entrained into that flame and that air provides the oxygen that's required for the chemical process, which is what burning actually is called oxidation. And then you have the fuel, the solid fuel is reacting with oxygen in the air in the presence of heat. You get this chemical reaction that liberates more heat. You get energy moving up as hot gas. You get energy moving in all directions um, by a process known as radiation. That heats the match. You also get some conduction along the match and that process repeats itself and the flame moves down along the match as that process continues. So you can see that something as simple as a match burning is an extremely complicated physical chemical process that requires a really deep level of understanding in order to engineer um, that process. And so that's what I, uh, that's what I now do is, is, is it the boundary between the structural engineering, understanding how structures behave and understanding how um, fire behaves and some of the interactions um, that occur that we need to engineer. And throughout my career, I've gotten involved um, in studying and trying to understand a number of very big, very newsworthy, uh, very important fires. So just three examples that, have, that I've crossed paths with during my, uh, during my career. Um, when I was doing my PhD, um, the September 11th attacks uh, occurred um, in New York City and very large fires associated with those attacks. I spent some time trying to understand those. Um, currently, I'm involved in the, uh, the Grenfell Tower Public Inquiry. Um, in the aftermath of this really horrific uh, uh, event, um, the anniversary uh, of which, the third year anniversary of which um, was just yesterday. Um, and, and more recently, um, I've gotten involved in thinking about some of the issues in the Notre Dame fire. And many of you will have seen um, or remember um, only too well, um, in particular, the Notre Dame fire uh, and the tragic uh, Grenfell Tower fire. Um, but I've also gotten involved in, in, in um, more positive aspects of fire safety, thinking about how we design um, and construct some of the most interesting um, and important structures that society relies on. Uh, the Shard, uh, for instance, in, in London is, is, a, is a heavily engineered um, structure. A lot of fire engineering um, went into that. Uh, I didn't work on it, but I'm, but I'm aware of the work that was done on the Shard. Um, we do a lot of work looking, for instance, at fires in tunnels um, and how do we protect um, subways and rail tunnels, for instance, um, like Crossrail. 
uh, in London from fires or the Channel Tunnel, for instance. And really recently, we've gotten really interested in tall timber buildings. Timber is now becoming a material that's being used in very tall structures. Uh, and the picture that I'm showing here is an example of a 300 meter tall tower, um, which was proposed a few years ago at the Barbican site. So trying to understand, obviously because timber burns, how do we engineer these structures to make them safe from fire? Uh, and all of these uh, areas, obviously very exciting areas to work in. I've also been really lucky to have gotten involved um, over the past five or six years um, with some work in television. So I have been involved in uh, creating um, uh, and, and presenting episodes of an engineering documentary series called Impossible Engineering. And that's been a real joy because what it's allowed me to do is to, is to go around and visit all these really amazing um, engineering structures and engineered artifacts. Um, and to, uh, to be taken to them and allowed to climb on them and in them and under them and really get a deep understanding both for the engineering and for the hippos along with them. So that just gives you a sense hopefully of sort of where I've come from and, and, and the areas where I, where I currently work. Um, if I had um, uh, three pieces of advice for anyone who's considering uh, a career uh, in engineering, in fact a career in any area, um, what the secret for success is, and, and certainly what I've tried to do throughout my career, when making decisions about what it was that I wanted to do, um, is first and foremost to be interested in what you choose, because if you're not interested, you're not going to enjoy it, and if you're not going to enjoy it, um, that's not going to be very good. Um, to second, be, second, to be interesting, um, in that try to make sure your work is interesting to other people, and then you'll get their attention, and people will come and they'll want to work with you and around you. Um, and then, in that vein, um, to surround yourself with exceptional people. And if you manage to do that, uh, be interested, be interesting, and surround yourself with exceptional people, then that's a recipe for a really interesting and happy uh, professional life, no matter what you choose to do, whether it's engineering or, or something else. So I'll just conclude um, with that, and now I'm happy to take your question. Hi, Luke. Thank you very much for your presentation there. Uh, what we'll do, I'll just st stop sharing that screen there. Um, I'll make sure people can see me as well. Okay, uh, I'm going to have a look through some questions. Now, if people can send their questions into the Q&A section at the bottom of their screen as well. Um, I'll start us off uh, first, Luke, if that's okay, with a question. Uh, what is the favourite part of your job, do you think? Um, the, my favourite part of my job, um, I think, is uh, the thing I get, I think, I think I, it's a toss-up, really, between... Um, between teaching, I, I do love teaching. So being a university professor, an engineering professor is great because it allows you to interact with large numbers of enthusiastic young people. Um, and I think that that's, um, that certainly I find uh, very invigorating um, and I, I enjoy that immensely. I'm lucky enough at, at Edinburgh that I get to teach first year engineering students, um, which is a big group of very excited um, young people. So that's that's great. Um, and the other thing is, is the work that I do um, uh, in our labs, so running experiments. Um, you can imagine if you if you work in in fire safety engineering and fire safety science, experiments sometimes can be very exciting. Um, we you mm -hmm. know we our job is essentially to to heat things up or set them on fire and then and then study what happens um, and understand the physics of what's going on. So so um, you know we we. We, 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 we burn lots of things to try to understand um, how they react. And, and that's very, very interesting. You know, like I said, we all think we have this intuitive understanding of fire, which of course we all do. Um, but then when you try to actually unpick what's going on, um, it becomes uh, in a way uh, even more beautiful and even more alluring as a consequence of, of this deeper understanding that you're trying to gain and, and just trying to figure it out because it's so complicated and so complex. Um, is a real joy and really exciting. I know then you mentioned about obviously now being an academic. Do you, do you prefer being an ac ac academic now? Uh, I mean, it's a question, prefer, uh, prefer to what? I mean, one of the, one of the things that it's important for me to say uh, and that I joke about is that I've never actually had any other job. You know, I, I, uh, the, only, the only job I've had outside of, um, you know, the, the university system um, was uh, I used to I used to work as a sales clerk at a Toys R Us store, um, perhaps because of my love of Lego. I don't know, 
Um, so, so, you know, when I was in, when I was in secondary school, I had a, a job at a Toys R Us store. I actually worked at Toys R Us for six years. Um, but subsequent to that, you know, all of, all of my work has been, um, in, in the university system. I went from an undergraduate degree, um, directly into a master's degree and then directly into a PhD and then directly into an assistant professorship. Um, and eventually found my way um, to, to being a professor here at Edinburgh. So I don't know what the alternative is. I do love being an academic, and I do think that being an academic, the, the, the greatest thing about being an academic is that provided you're doing something productive and useful, um, no one really tells you what you should study, um, which means that my, my first rule um, of, of being a happy professional is to be interested. Um, and if by definition you do the things that you're interested in, academia is one of the only jobs that allows you um, to do that. And provided you can be interesting and surround yourself with people to help you, then you can be successful as an academic doing exactly what it is that interests you. Um, and that's quite a unique um, position to be in. So that's wonderful. Yeah. What was it like then uh, transitioning through to TV then? Uh, I mean, that, uh, I, I mean, that also links, I mean, that's, that's linked to my, to my, my view that you need to be interesting. Um, and so for me, that was a real, um, a real, a really great opportunity to, to see if I could be interesting, right. To see if I could, um, on camera, uh, uh, talk about engineering in a way that people would be interested in the things that I was talking about, because engineering can get quite technical and can get a bit dry sometimes. Um, I don't think it is dry, dry at all, but the challenge is to make people who aren't interested in engineering uh, become interested in engineering. And that was, that was great. You know, that, I mean, that happens. I don't, I don't actually know how it happened. Um, it happened, I think, because I gave a talk at the Royal Academy of Engineering in London about um, fire safety engineering. And there were some journalists there. Uh, and I think one of them liked my talk and suggested me to this TV production company. And then they phoned me up and, you know, when someone like me um, gets a phone call from a TV production company uh, and they say, I think the first, the first episode I did, they said, um, you know, Luke, we know you love talking about engineering. Do you want to go um, on a boat with us to the World War II era sea forts that are in the Thames estuary that nobody really ever gets to see um, and talk about um, how they were engineered uh, and how they came into existence? And, and we're going to pay for all of this. I thought, well, yes, obviously. I mean, obviously, I'm going to do that. That's really exciting. Um, and then, you know, I enjoyed that so much, uh, and I guess they they thought that I did okay. So it just it just snowballed. And now, you know, I've probably been in I don't know a dozen different episodes of, of the series talking about all sorts of things: bridges, tunnels, um, radar installations. You know, they've. They've had me climbing through through World War II bombers. They've had me flying around in, in biplanes. They've had me um, hanging off uh, bridges, um, climbing in, in tunnels. Uh, it's really exciting, really interesting. It, and it lets you see the world that nobody else gets to see, which is great. Uh, we've got a good question here about that as well. Uh, what, what's your favorite episode you think you've done of Impossible Engineering? Um, the, the one that I, ooh, I mean... The one that I uh, I don't the one, the one that the one that I enjoyed the most well it's a question of what you mean by enjoy the one that was most exciting to film was um, one on um, radar World War II radar installations along the south coast uh, of the United Kingdom uh, and that was exciting because um, I got to fly a biplane um, so I mean literally I was in the front seat of a biplane and, and the guy the pilot who was behind me who was actually flying it we had gopro cameras hooked to the airplane um and at one point we were flying um uh, over dover and he said okay luke you know take a hold of the, the the stick in front of you and and you'll fly uh and i i, I couldn't believe it and he, he it was a nice cloudy day with kind of fluffy clouds and sunshine um and i don't know I mean, for me it was interesting because I've, I've often had a we all dream that we can fly occasionally right and you have these dreams where you're flying through the clouds i think um and he said go for it you know live, live your dream fly through the and you know go through the hole wow. in the clouds and, and I, yep. it's incredible um, absolutely incredible um the one from in, in engineering terms the one that i that i enjoyed the most was one that we filmed um just recently and hasn't aired yet so it's upcoming um where I got to climb the fourth rail bridge um, in Scotland, uh, which is an incredible structure not far from where I am uh, right now. We got to we got to climb up to the top of that and, and look down over the fourth estuary, and that was 
for me as, as, a, as, a, as a lifetime lover of bridges for me that was pretty special fantastic so that's one of your upcoming episodes did you say I'm, i don't think that one's aired in the uk yet yeah that'll yeah. be upcoming F- fantastic uh, we've got some good questions here that have come through on the q a facility as well so uh, what what is a thing that you will never forget during your career Ooh, um well, I mean, the things that the things that stick with me, um, I mean, I'll never forget um, as a PhD student waking up and going into the office and um, getting a phone call from my uh, my girlfriend at the time telling me about the planes that had flown into the World Trade Center towers. Um, and then, you know, going online and seeing that unfold. Um, and I, I guess equally, I'll never forget um, waking up uh, uh, in, in 2017 in June when the Grenfell Tower fire happened. Um, waking up that morning and seeing the news um, was was quite something. Certainly, something. It's sort of those one of those where are where were you moments. Yeah, it's something I'll always remember. Yeah, I, I bet it's incredibly impactful in in your life. In, um, in, indeed, well, in every in, yes, in many yeah. people's lives. Yeah. Yes, um, we've got a question here from you. Uh, she's asking. We know Luke is very successful in both industry and academia. Um, could I know which title Luke prefers? Is it an engineer or professor? Namely, which ident- uh, identity, scientist or engineer? Mm. I mean, I don't know if I would agree necessarily with the kind of dichotomy there, you know, scientist or, or engineer. Um, I, uh, the, you know, I mean, the reason I'm an engineer and not a physicist is because I, I like the idea that the science that I understand will be applied somehow. Um, uh, so, you know, whilst I have great respect for pure scientists, um, for me, uh, it's, uh, you know, I used, to, and like I said, I used to build skateboard ramps. And what was interesting to me is like, how do you build the best skateboard ramp? Um, well, you need to understand, I mean, building a skateboard launch ramp is actually quite a, quite a complex thing. You don't want to have you don't want to have be going along the pavement and then have the ramp just be a flat ramp, right? Because then there's a kind of a thump as you go up the ramp and you lose speed. And if you lose speed, you lose height and you lose fun, right? Um, so getting that curvature to the ramp just right. But if you have too much curvature, you go straight up, right? So you want to, you have to understand trajectory. Um, but also when you build a ramp out of wood, you have to understand how wood flexes and bends and warps and has forces applied to it because you don't want it to be too rigid but you don't want it to be too springy so you know all of these understanding the interaction between the physics of what's going on the mechanics of the materials you know um, the physics of trajectory um, um understanding where energy goes and how energy changes forms how do you turn velocity into height you know all these interesting questions um, I mean, that's just a really good illustration of why, for me, understanding uh, how a launch ramp works is not enough. I want to I want to build it and then I want to use it. Um, and that's why, for me, being an engineer is very different than, a, than a, being a pure scientist and, and why, um, you know, I think I think the reason I the reason I, I like being a professor is more related to my love of teaching. Um, uh, than it is to to necessarily um, any dichotomy between science versus application. Um, for me, it's all part of the same package. Right. Yeah, um, we've got a question from James here. So you you design buildings and structures that are resistant to fire, uh, but uh, do you have to be aware of how it looks or how weather will affect the structure? Yeah. Okay. So I mean, I mean, it's important for me to say, you know, I Luke Bisbee don't design structures. OK, um, so I mean, I'm, a, I'm an academic. Uh, I have only ever designed one structure that exists in reality, and that's a, a pedestrian bridge that I designed, which is at the University of Sherbrooke in, in Canada. Um, but academics in general don't tend to get involved in, in design consultancy. So it's important for me to, to, to say that. Um, uh, do we have to worry about how it looks? Um, uh, and other issues like the weather. Yes, of, of, of course. I mean, I mean, a structural engineer who is designing, for instance, a high-rise building or a, a bridge, a pedestrian bridge, or whatever, um, has to consider all the relevant load cases. So wind, earthquake, um, fire, um, obviously. I'll, I'll never forget when, when, when we were designing that pedestrian bridge in Sherbrooke that I mentioned. Um, in Sherbrooke, it snows a lot. Um, you get very deep snow. It's in Canada and Quebec. 
Um, and uh, I'll never forget having uh, to really figure out what the snow loads. It's a pedestrian bridge that has a roof. And we really struggled with um, the snow loads on the roof because of the amount of snow. You, you, you would be surprised how much snow weighs, actually. Um, so, um, so yeah, you have to consider all those things. Um, with respect to the aesthetics of the structure, um, I have always believed, and I do believe, that, um, that the, the best structural engineers in the world are those who um, use physics to generate the aesthetics. Um, and a perfect example of that would be the fourth rail bridge. The fourth rail bridge, if you've ever seen it, is an absolutely beautiful structure. It's called a cantilever structure and it's, it's painted red and it spans the fourth um, estuary up here in Scotland. Um, and I often say that it's the structure that you can see it flexing its muscles. Even if you don't know physics, there's this kind of intuition about the way it looks that says, this is a strong structure. Um, and it's beautiful because of its strength. Um, and its strength is due to the way it was built and its aesthetic, which is intimately linked to the physics um, that gives it its strength. And, and so um, I think the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, the best structures in the world are those that we can see intuitively doing what they're doing. Obviously, uh, you have lots of different avenues uh, within your career um, with TV and being an academic now as well. Um, what do you do kind of away from uh, engineering, Luke, to kind of de-stress? Or what are your hobbies? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a running joke with, with uh, I mean, maybe not so much a joke, but it's a, it, is a, it is a running um, a joke and challenge with my colleagues um, to figure out what my hobbies are. Um, I've, nev I've never been one of these people who believes that we must have a break between our work and our life. Um, um, so, you know, I, I've always believed that if you, you know, if you truly are interested in what it is that you do for your work, um, then it isn't work, is it? I mean, it's, it's fun. Um, and what better way to live than to be having fun all the time? Um, so then you don't, you don't really need hobbies. Now that's not to say I don't have hobbies. Um, I still love building things out of wood. So carpentry is something, um, carpentry, DIY, that sort of thing. Um, I love doing um, I have two young young children. I have a four-year-old son and a one-year-old daughter, um, and they uh, they take up a lot of my time, as you can imagine. I love spending time with them. Um, uh, and you know, I like you know, uh, you if you live in Scotland and don't enjoy hill walking, then you're really missing out. Um, with two young kids, it's hard to find the time to get out into the hills as much as I, I would like, but I love doing that as well. Um, so some examples. Yes, there are, and obviously there are all kind of things that you can do during COVID at the moment as well. Um, are, are you working, at, I'm guessing you're working at home at the moment, Luke? Yes, yes, I'm in my dining room office at the moment, yeah. How, how are you finding it? Is, it? is it easier, do you think, or is it, has it been quite hard? Um, I, mean, it's quite, I mean, to be honest, it's quite hard. Um, uh, I mean, given, given what I do, the, the, the challenges associated with, with, um, with COVID, which are minuscule compared to some of the challenges that people are facing, obviously. Um, is uh, is lack of childcare um, because if you don't have childcare, it's actually quite hard to be um, productive um, at home. Um, working and taking care of two small children at the same time is a is not an easy thing to do. Um, it's funny. It's it's the kind of thing you don't realize how hard it is until you're asked to do it, and then you're like, wow, this is really quite challenging. Um, and the other is that we don't have access to our labs um, at the moment where we can run fire experiments. Uh, and do our research and obviously if you uh, you know fire safety research is, is not the kind of thing you want to be doing at home um, at all uh, so so yeah the, some challenges there but as I said you know under the circumstances um, I've got it very good uh, we've got another question here uh, on the Q&A uh, it's just talking about what's the biggest project you think you've worked on you might have touched on this already but what's the biggest project that you think you've worked on um I mean, I guess it depends what you mean by it depends what you mean by project. Um, I mean, I've I've been involved in uh, I was involved in an in investigation of a construction site fire on a on a very very large building in Central Asia, the tallest building in Central Asia. Um, uh, I've been involved in uh, the aftermath of fires in in a number of other very tall buildings. Um, 
but, but, and, and, and a number of tunnels as well. So I've gotten involved in a number of, of, of questions around tunnel design for fire safety. Um, but in terms of the, the amount of work involved, um, I would say that, you know, the Grenfell Tower Public Inquiry has been um, the largest single piece of work that I've, that I've been involved in um, and, and continues to be, um, you know, um, something that's quite central to my day-to-day -day, um, thoughts and activities. Um, you know, that's been uh, two and a half years uh, of work uh, already and will we'll continue. Um, obviously, a very worthwhile work and, and really important work for the UK going forward. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm just going to look through a few more questions that have come up as well here let me just go through those um so what qualifications did you need uh, to become an engineer luke um well i mean i've, I've said i was educated in canada mm -hmm. um so my undergraduate degree was in was in canada although i should say now teaching at the university of edinburgh an undergraduate degree in canada and an undergraduate degree um in the uk in engineering are is a very similar degree um, so they're, they're actually not that different. Um, in Canada, um, what I needed was a bachelor's degree in engineering, and then I needed um, to be licensed as a professional engineer, which is essentially like an apprenticeship period that lasts for um, four or five years after you get your degree. Um, in the UK, um, to be a, a chartered engineer, which is um, kind of the equivalent of professional engineer from the Canadian context, you need a, a, a master's degree in engineering um, and then you need to register with, with one of the professional institutions um, that offers chartered status. So I, I said, I'm a chartered structural engineer, so I have uh, a chartered structural engineering status with the Institution of Structural Engineers. That's the institution that I chose um, to be chartered with. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what you need. You, you essentially need a master's degree. Now, if you, wanna, if you wanna become an academic and work as a, as a lecturer or, or eventually a professor, um, then you need a, a PhD or a doctorate degree. Um, and so for me, that path was quite a long path. Um, and that, you know, that's worth thinking about if you think you might want to be an academic. I did an undergraduate degree that was four years. Then I did a master's degree that was two years. Then I did a doctoral or PhD um, degree that was four years. So I spent 10 years um, after high school in education. But the thing I always hasten to point out, because people think, ah, oh, in school for another 10 years, um, is that for my master's degree and my PhD, um, I was getting paid. Uh, to do those degrees. So I had a stipend paid a salary and the salary that I was getting was actually not that different from the salary that I'd be earning um, had I been out there in industry. Um, so, um, you know, uh, if you think you might want to be an engineer, the thing to do is to first, um, you know, enroll in a university program in engineering, try that on, um, see how you like it. The great thing about an engineering degree, one of the really great things about an engineering uh, degree is that it, it doesn't teach you um, if you choose the right degree, it doesn't choose you necessarily a vocational skill set. Uh, what it treats you as a way of thinking, or what it, what it gives you as a, as a way of thinking, um, and that way of thinking can be ported into all sorts of different professions, whether it's law or medicine or finance um, or whatever. Um, so, it, you yeah. know, I think, I think engineering is actually a very good modern first degree, um, regardless of what you might want to do. Many of my friends um, who I did undergraduates with. In fact, most of them don't actually work as civil engineers at all. Sorry, I've lost your, I've lost your sound. Oh, sorry. It would, the, sorry, yeah, sorry, the mic just went off then. Sorry, Luke. Um, we've just got a question here. Look, kind of Lincoln to that is saying, is structural engineering a well-paid job? Uh, I mean, everything is relative, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, it probably, I mean, given the things I've said, it probably won't surprise you to hear me say that I don't think when choosing a career, money is a very good, uh, mm -hmm. a, a good thing to be thinking about. Um, no matter what career you choose, um, if you're good at it, uh, if you're interested, interesting, and surround yourself with the right people, um, you will make a comfortable living. Um, and that is true of structural engineering as it is with most any other um, career that you might choose. Yes. Um, you're not gonna earn, uh, you know, you're, you're not gonna be up there with the highest earners in society um, uh, unless you are uh, quite a successful engineer. Um, many successful engineers have done very, very well um, uh, financially. Um, but, you know, the, the, the nice thing about being an engineer is that society is always going to need um, engineers to solve its problems. Um, and, you know, we're, we are, 
we, we, we are going to live in cities. We are going to need transportation. We are going to need water. We are going to need power. Um, all of these things rely, we're going to need communication. All of these things rely on engineers. So engineering, from my perspective, you know, it isn't, it isn't one of those careers where you're going to become hugely wealthy unless you do something very clever or are extremely, extremely um, uh, accomplished at what you do, which you may well be. Um, but it's also not one of those careers that is going to fall into not being necessary anymore in our society. Um, so I, you know, I think it's, I think it's a fantastic choice as a career. Yeah. I think it's, it links to what you said before is that you need to enjoy what you're doing. Um, yeah, no, that's what you should ask yourself, you know, ask, ask yourself what you enjoy doing. Um, and if it's not engineering, fine, don't do engineering. Um, but if you think, uh, if you think you might enjoy engineering, then, um, then give it a go. And, you know, life is long and we have choices and we can change directions as we go. Um, and as I've said, engineering, I think is a career where if you, if you start out in engineering and you decide at some point you don't want to do that anymore and you'd rather be a lawyer, uh, you know, or a doctor or, or, you know, whatever, uh, you can do that. I think that's some really good advice for the, those young engineers who are, who are listening today. Um, we've got another one here. So do you have to adapt? Uh, sorry, did you have to adapt yourself to work in the UK after moving from Canada? And is there any big differences uh, from engineering methods or cultural between North America and Europe at all? Um, I mean, culturally, yes, there's quite a big difference actually between Canada and the UK. Um, my parents are English, um, so I was born a British citizen, and it was very easy, um, sort of procedurally, it was very easy for me to come to the UK because I was a British citizen already, despite having been raised in Canada. Um, and I visited um, the UK many times in my life, and as I mentioned, I lived in Bristol when I was when I was a young boy. So I kind of knew what I was getting myself into, um, and that wasn't too challenging. Um, the, the university systems in Canada um, uh, and the UK are actually very similar. So there wasn't a huge difference there in terms of the way the university works. Um, you know, I, one of the key reasons I moved to the UK from, from Canada um, was because of a key, what I think is a cultural difference in the engineering mindset in that in, in North America, engineering, I feel is slightly more constrained by um, design codes and rules. And so, um, it's a much less uh, creative environment for engineering. Whereas in the, in the UK, um, in, in structural engineering, um, the design of buildings in the UK is governed by a set of building regulations that are called functional building regulations, which, which specifies how, uh, you know, the, the, the functions that buildings have to fulfill. So we, we, don't, we don't say you must build it like that. We say when you've built it, it must do this, and do that. Um, and that allows a little bit more creativity in engineering, which is one of the reasons I wanted to come to the UK, because it's an environment where, where one can really use one's um, detailed understanding of the physics and the science in order to generate engineering designs that are perhaps more interesting or more exciting or more innovative. Now, now the important caveat there is that, that that, of course, requires an engineering profession to be extremely competent and self-aware um, of its competence. Um, and that's one of the things that, that, that you know, the construction industry in the UK right now is doing a lot of soul searching about, about those issues and, and rightfully so. Fantastic. I just want to say a really big thank you to you, Luke, uh, for answering all those questions there today. No problem. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed answering them and enjoyed doing your presentation. Um, I want to say a big thank you to all those who've been sending those questions in and been watching today. Um, it's been really good. Been seeing some fantastic questions that have come in uh, on Zoom and on Facebook Live as well. Uh, I have just I've put in a link to our survey on the chat as well. Please join us for our upcoming interviews as well. Uh, if you follow our social media channels, you'll be able to sign up for those there. Um, so thank you, everyone. I think we'll leave it there. Thank you. See you, Luke, again. No problem. Thanks Bye very much. Everyone. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Bye everyone.